Good evening. Welcome, dear brothers and sisters. Thank you, fathers, for having us, for welcoming us here at this very beautiful church. I stand here uh, as a sister of St. Faustina, and this is the only reason why I, why I feel, okay, I can speak to them. I can share some words with them. Uh, no other reason, just because my sister is St. Faustina, and I hope she will simply use my presence here to, to speak towards me. Um, this, this is my wish, this is my desire, so it, that it will happen. But uh, let us say a short prayer at the very beginning so that this meeting really makes sense. Like not only, okay, some people met at the church and okay, it was fun or it wasn't. Uh, let's make it more uh, spiritual, simply inviting the Holy Spirit to come and touch our hearts, okay? In the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Dear Lord, I ask you to, to come. Uh, may your Holy Spirit come and open our hearts for your words so that uh, I may say only this what you want me to say and that all our hearts may be open to, to receive your message. This what you want to share with us. Which may, may this be a meeting of brothers and sisters uh, immersed in your in the ocean of your mercy. Um, Saint Faustina, please be here with us. Uh, uh, Saint John Paul II, please, I, I beg you to, to intercede for us. Come Holy Spirit, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, our kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from. Amen. Um, while sitting here in the bench in the church and waiting for the meeting, and seeing the darkness behind the uh, the, the windows the stained glass here. Uh, I recalled a very special moment from the life of Sister Faustina. Uh, it was also evening, the day when she saw Jesus for the first time, like we can see him on the image. It was Sunday evening. Today is Wednesday, Wednesday, yeah, Wednesday evening. But still we can hear, especially in this church, we can feel some special, uh, I would say, very holy atmosphere that always evening brings, you know? Everything gets peaceful. We finished our work. There are no more, more plans for this day. It's just you and him, yeah? Finally, there's some time to simply be with God and let him speak. Sister Faustina, on that very evening, came back to her room and wasn't expecting anything unusual. She just finished the day and entered her room to go to bed, probably. And suddenly she saw Jesus, you know, standing in front of her. She saw Jesus, you know, it's a... Uh, she had some revelations before, gently, some slowly, slowly, step by step. Jesus was guiding her and preparing her for that very revelation, yes. The first, we could say, revelation she had was uh, at the church when she was still a child. And she simply felt the presence of God. Like, really, she was in front of the monstrance, in front of the blessed sacrament. And though being a child, she could profoundly understand that this is God in this white piece of bread. And this is a living person. It's not a theory. It's not a knowledge about God. It's experiencing God. And she had that being a little, a little child. Uh, it was so strong that 
afterwards receiving her first communion, uh, she behaved differently as all the other children. All the other children on their way home, they were simply rejoicing with their beautiful dresses and probably presents they will get from the family or something, the party that will take place after the First Communion. And she was walking alone. So one of the, her neighbors saw her uh, and asked Helena, because that was her name from the baptism, Helena, why are you walking alone? Being concerned, something happened probably, why are you walking alone? And Helena said, I'm not walking alone. And she continued on, alone, but not alone. So starting from the very first years of her life, we can already see the secret of her holiness, actually, already then. She was never alone. She never thought about herself like in a um, singular, this is the correct, in singular, she always thought about herself in plural, me and him, we. Look, how it changes perspective of life if we stop thinking, I have to go and do this. I will do that. I will say this, I will prepare that. No, we will do this, we will prepare that. This is our responsibility, this is our work. Wow, so, so much brighter, yes? Uh, especially in our times, uh, so many people are burdened with what they have to do. It's too much, simply. It's too much, too quick, too, too serious, too big. Um, I cannot do it by myself. Why so many suicides? I am by myself and I cannot continue on by myself. And Helena has this beautiful, it's more than intuition. She's very much aware of the fact, I am not alone, never ever. There's not a single moment when I am alone. Always we. So then uh, Helena has this first revelation that's, um, that amazes her and impacts, impacts her deeply. And it's very unusual because it takes place during a party, yes, a dance. She's simply on a party with uh, her other friends. It, uh, it's not in some religious place, it's in the city center. Uh, she's wearing a pink dress. She's there to dance and to have fun with others. And in such circum circumstances, when she started to dance with a boy, suddenly music stopped for her. You know, she, she stopped hearing the music, she stopped seeing the people, and she sees just him. And that's the first revelation she, ha she has, like, really seeing Jesus, not only feeling his presence or hearing somehow his voice in her heart, but she sees him on a party. And this is the moment when he expresses very clearly how much he's longing for her and how much he wants her to enter the convent. And so she, she runs, she, she quickly follows the, uh, the desi Jesus' desire, and she goes to Warsaw. This is the city where she entered the convent. And we could say, we could, you could think, okay, if, if Jesus himself expressed the desire towards her, okay, I want you to enter the convent, easy, yes? 
okay, I will. It, the will of God is very clear towards me. It's so good. I do not have to go through this tiring process of discernment. Yes. We, the people who entered the convent, we know how much it costs, you know, to discern the will of God, whether it is really my vocation, whether this is really the place where God wants me to be and I will be happy. Uh, it takes sometimes many years of struggles and purifications. And Faustina, you know, Jesus appears, says, I want you to enter the convent. She says, okay. And she enters and she is a saint now. Yeah? Nice story. <laughs> but what does it have to do with us? Yes, normal people. Um, it's amazing that uh, she always experienced this, I would say, um, you know, like on one hand, Jesus expressed his desire towards her very clearly. But on the other hand, he didn't help her at all to fulfill them. Yeah. Um, didn't help her at all. I mean, like, you know, it seemed like he abandoned her in that way that it was so difficult. So now he says, okay, enter the convent. He even says, enter the convent in Warsaw. So it seems to be easy. Just go to Warsaw and find any convent. But suddenly she knocks from door to door and they do not want to accept her. That's the first trial, you would say. Yes. Then I assume she asked herself questions. Was it really from God? Like, why now so many difficulties? And uh, the congregation where I am and where she entered, that was the only congregation that gave her a chance. So they didn't actually accept her like, welcome, yeah? But they told her, okay, come back in a year time. So another trial, yes. And for a year, she was preparing herself, not being 100% sure whether they will accept her or not. Yeah. But they did. Praise be to God, they did. Uh, yes. And now all the other congregations who didn't accept her, you know what they are going through. Such great saint, and we rejected her. So Faustina entered the convent, and after a few years of really hard time, really, really hard time. She didn't have like uh, everlasting honeymoon in the convent. It was a time of many struggles and purifications, starting from the very beginning. You would say, oh, that's risky, Jesus, you know? You invite someone to follow you, and starting from day one, you make it hard. Who would follow you? you know? And Faustina, she's going through many trials and what's very difficult in these experiences she is going through is that on the human level, she's alone. She doesn't have anyone who would really understand her so she feels abandoned spiritually because God allowed that to happen. She doesn't feel God. She doesn't feel his presence. She even feels rejected by God. Being like 21, 22, this is the time of such experiences. You know? And in this situation, she has no one who would say, oh, don't worry, this is a classical, a mystical experience, you know, Afterwards, it will be a honeymoon, yes. And you probably you will be a great saint because this is what great saints go through, so no worries. So she's going through all this, being very young, and after many fights and surviving this inner 
war, war uh, she's ready to start the mission. So the first years of her religious life were to prepare her for the worldwide mission. And when she is uh, 26, I guess, uh, 1931, when, if she's born 1905, so she's 26, this revelation takes place. On the, on the evening when she was in her cell, alone in her room, suddenly she saw Jesus like this, in a white garment, with the right hand lifted in the gesture of blessing, and this two rays emanating from his heart. And he expressed his desire, paint an image according to this what you see, to the pattern you see. I want this image to be venerated all over the world, and I will give many graces through it. Therefore, may each soul have an access to that image. And again, you would say, okay, so she went through so many purifications, and now the mission begins. Jesus has painted an image, so shortly, uh, shortly afterwards, he will give her uh, money, painter, and um, understanding among the sisters in the community who will support her. Yes, none of these things. No. And that's, of course, we will say, that's normal, because you shouldn't believe every person who says, I saw Jesus. Yeah, that, that's very wise, that's, that's the wisdom of church, to keep the distance, to check, to, to test the person, to ask many questions, to give some time for discernment. But she was really abandoned in this mission, and when she wanted to give up, and when she was telling Jesus, please find someone else, I'm not good enough for the mission. I cannot do it, you know I cannot do it. I cannot paint, I'm weak in health, I have no money, I, uh, and she, you know, she, she names all the uh, impossibilities. And merciful Jesus, if he is really merciful, he should say, okay, I understand, I will search for someone else. But no, no, that's not real mercy. He says, in this situation, when she's really left with the mission, alone, in this very situation, when she wants to, you know, um, how to say, go aside, let's say, to leave the mission and to um, convince Jesus that he should find someone else, that, that, that the whole globe is full of better people for that mission. In that very moment, Jesus tells her, if you will leave the mission, you will be responsible for many souls on the last day, on the day of judgment. So he doesn't solve the problem, he just makes it worse. <laughs> and I cannot imagine what she was going through, you know. I cannot do what he wants me to do. He doesn't help me to do it. And he even threatens me. The merciful God. And that was another trial. You know, she needed to go through all these experiences, not losing hope, not losing trust that, okay, he's guiding me. Because of uh, actually the key word in the divine mercy message, the key, um, not word, but attitude in the divine mercy message. And the key attitude is written on the image the middle word of the sentence, Jesus, I trust in you. Faustina is the best example of someone who really trusts 
while not understanding at all. Trust is not here, yes? In mind, you can have total darkness. There might be just doubts and fear and totally everything is beyond any logic and it makes no sense from the human perspective. But it's about your heart, whether you trust or not. It's about, it's about your decision, whether you decide to trust in that situation, which is obviously very difficult, or you say, no, thanks, uh, that's too, too much for me. I, I choose some easier ways. Surely you don't want me to become martyr, right? So leave me alone and let me go. Actually, many Christians uh, on the path to perfection, that means to holiness, they move, move back, I would say to move, move away. They simply leave the, the fight, they, they leave the battlefield. And the kingdom is for those who will run till the very last day, not just the first stage. And when, it's, when you become sweating, yes, and your muscles start hurting, and there are no bottles with water on the side, you say, no, sorry, it's impossible. This marathon is not to be finished in my case, sorry. I go back to the hotel, five stars hotel. So, finally, after a few years of struggling, the first image is painted. Uh, there, there appears uh, a priest, Faustina's confessor, future confessor, Father Michał Sopochko, who is already blessed, uh, and he as he later admitted, he didn't believe Faustina. It was not like, okay, well, this girl, she really saw Jesus, and Jesus really wants her to paint an image, so I'm in. No, he says, I was just curious. So God used his curiosity, this is the word, curiosity, to start this great mission, now worldwide mission. Yeah? So the image was painted. They found, found a professional painter who painted the first image. Faustina saw the image. She cried a little, uh, being very disappointed with the result of his work. Um, but then Jesus um, calmed calm her heart, saying, Faustina, do not cry. The power of that image is not in the beauty of canvas, but in the grace that I will give through it anyway. Look, that's interesting that the miraculous images are usually not the most beautiful ones. The most beautiful ones are in the museums, and the most powerful ones are in the churches. Couldn't we say the same about us human beings, about women and men of this world, the most beautiful ones and the most seemingly powerful ones are on the covers of magazines, but those who really change the world, so many times they stay hidden, totally hidden for the eyes of the world. This is even a um, quotation from the, there's even a quotation from the diary, so Jesus' words from Faustina's diary, when he says about these chosen souls who really changed the history of the world. There are not many, but many enough to change the world and to sustain the world. That's interesting why the history keeps on moving, yes? Why the world keeps on rolling. You could say, Lord, there's so much evil in the world. 
why do you keep on giving us another day? Why the final judgment, the, the day of God's anger, haven't come yet? Why? And even Faustina had such questions, you know, when God gave her special grace of seeing all the sins of the world in one moment. That was the day of, that was the New Year's Eve, wasn't it? You know what's New Year's Eve. The whole world is on a party. And of course you can have fun with your friends and it can be okay, it can be totally good, uh, but you know, I know that also many, many painful uh, hurt, yes, many painful situations and a lot of sin is happening on that very night. And she saw it. She saw it in some inner vision and after which she fainted because it was too much. She couldn't handle it. And when she was awakened, she, she was asking Jesus, I do not understand you. Why you still keep on showing us mercy? One day Jesus uh, told Faustina that mercy is actually beyond understanding of the angels, perfect spirits. They have the perfect knowledge. Everything is perfect in angels. And they have problems with understanding God's mercy. There is even a theory, theory, theological theory, why uh, there was this, um, how do you say, the fallen angels? So there was this, the moment when they decided they will go aside. Yes, they will, they won't be in the plan of God. What was the reason why they decided to, to leave God and yeah, to start their own way? And the theory says, uh, because that's a mystery for us, but we can, you know, try to find out. And so the theory says that uh, this is, it happened when uh, Jesus told them about the idea of incarnation and giving his life for people, for the sinners. And then they said, no, you won't do it. You, the king of the world, king of kings, lord of lords, creator of heaven and earth, one of them, and giving his life for them? No. And it's not only a problem, the problem of angels, because we also have this problem in some percentage. Each one of us, in some percentage, is the older son. That's the problem of the older son from the parable about the merciful father. It's so hard for us to accept that God can forgive sins to all those Bastards, I don't know which words you use, you know, like, there's such words, right? I know, mercy for me, of course, yes, please, but for them, and can you imagine that one day we may sit in the same bench in heaven with them, or let's say at the same table at a big uh, party in heaven that it depends the image of heaven you have in your head. Uh, it has always been problem uh, of our understanding of mercy, justice, <laughs> human mercy, human justice, God's mercy, God's justice. Uh, it's not the same, totally not the same. And it's difficult to understand and to accept uh, many times. So Faustina has the revelation uh, 
first image is painted, and nowadays we live in the times when Jesus' desire, you could say it's almost fulfilled, because he said, I want this image to be venerated all over the world, and I will give many graces through it. And so it happens. This is now, 21st century. In Poland, of course, you can find the image in every church. There are other countries where you can find it in every second church. And there, there are other countries where in every fifth church, but surely there's no continent or there's not even one country or one city in the world without this image. And now in the year of mercy, it, the speed is, our sisters at the Shrine of Divine Mercy who work at the store and they sell the Divine Mercy images, different sizes, different you know, types, you know, one printed on canvas, one painted on canvas, the other one printed on paper, thousands of, uh, thousands of ways of having the image. And so they say it's, it's crazy. They simply, they cannot, uh, how do they, they, the printing house is too slow, you know, to print the copies because there are so many people wanting the image, so many parish priests asking for the image to their churches. So praise be to God. Um, but it also shows us um, the importance and finally the openness of the people for the Divine Mercy message. This image, or better, Jesus, through this image, actually speaks to us. This is not just an image that we can say, oh, it's connected with the history of St. Faustina. No. Jesus, through this image, speaks to us. And much of this, what he speaks, is in the diary. So when you read the diary of St. Faustina precisely, you will find the exact quotations which uh, help you to uncover the mystery of the image step by step. Let, I, let us have a short introduction. You know, I won't tell you everything. That will be a challenge for you uh, to, to do it on your own. But when you look at the image, the first thing you look at is what? Okay, you are far away from the image, but if you stand in front of the image of merciful Jesus and it's quite close to you, what would be the first thing you would look at? His face. That's natural, right? We talk to each other, we look into each other's eyes. That's the beginning of every meeting. So what do these eyes say, the, the, the gaze from the image? Jesus said, my gaze from the image is like the gaze from the cross. And I always recall in that very moment when I listened to these words, I recall the moment on Golgotha when he was dying. And if I put myself on Golgotha, I know that I'm, I'm there not as playing the role of Our Lady, you know. I'm not the one who's without any sin and just feeling sorry for my son that he's dying, yes, that he's in such pain. I'm there as one of those who are responsible for his death. And to face the gaze of the victim, what would that gaze tell you? I love, uh, you know, going to prisoners 
sometimes we go on mission to, to prisons and then we also share with them the message of mercy. And sometimes I have a chance to talk to them. So I ask them, how do you feel under this gaze? How do you feel when he looks at you? How does it make you feel? And they are murderers, murderers, yes. Uh, they are sometimes people who uh, go and, uh, how would you say it, here back and again to the prison. So it's like they are addicted to making crimes, you know, committing crimes. They are like really, you would say, broken inside. So there's actually no way for them to to start to go back to normal life again and to be to live according to the law, not only the law of the country, but the law that God gave us. They are, it's impossible for them. And when they look on the face of Jesus, when they meet with the gaze of Jesus from that image, they say, I feel loved. I feel forgiven. And in that very moment, one story comes to my mind, and I will share with you a short testimony. Um, when you think about Poland, Poland is uh, mostly associated with the Second World War, isn't it? Yes, the great disaster, uh, drama of the 20th century, Second World War. So many people died. So many, Poland was in ruins after the Second World War. So you know about the concentration camps. I'm sure you do. And the biggest one, the most famous one, is Auschwitz, the concentration camp in Auschwitz. And the commandant, that's, that's a, probably the name, the commandant of that uh, uh, Auschwitz concentration camp was Rudolf Hess. Also famous man, but not famous because he did something good, but because he was so bad, so evil. And those who survived Auschwitz used to call him an animal. They wouldn't say he, is a, he was a bad man. He wasn't a bad man. He was an animal. And one day, uh, they took... Um, the whole community of Jesuit, fa Jesuit fathers from Krakow, they took all of the brothers and fathers to Auschwitz. Uh, only the superior was not at home at that very moment. Of That wasn't kidnapping. You know, they simply, I, I don't know the, the, the exact verb to express it, but it was uh, quite normal that they used to, you know, enter and take the people they wanted to Auschwitz for some reason. So they took the, the Jesuits, and when the superior was back, he, uh, he was so shocked and in such pain, and he said, I need to be with my brothers. So he, by himself, you know, without any pressure, it was his decision, he decided to go to Auschwitz to be with his brothers. But you cannot enter Auschwitz on your own because you want to, yeah? But he did it, you know? He found a hole, I don't know how he did it, but he entered the concentration camp searching for his, brother, for his brothers. And of course, guards found him and they took him to Rudolf Hess, to the commandant. Not even, you know, having these questions in their minds, oh, what will he do with him? because they were totally convinced that he will simply kill him without any questions. And how big was their surprise when he let him go? Simple like that, go back home from the concentration camp. <laughs> it's, 
It doesn't happen ever, ever, never, ever. So he left, and then Second World War was ended in some years. Rudolf Hess was, um, he received the punishment, death punishment, yes. They said that you are guilty for the crime on humanity, I guess this is the name. So the, that's the greatest crime any man can do. And you will be hanged in Auschwitz, in the place where you used to kill people. But before this, uh, the sentence uh, was carried out, he was uh, to wait for the sentence in the prison in Wadowice. By the way, this is the city where John Paul was born. Uh, so he, was, he knew he's going to the prison in Wadowice, and he was in such great fear. He was afraid of the prison. He wasn't afraid of the death in Auschwitz. He was afraid of the time in prison because he was totally convinced that Polish guards will take revenge on him and he will be tortured for all these days as long as he's in the prison. It will be unimaginable pain for him day by day, minute by minute. This was his idea of the time in prison awaiting for death. And how great was his surprise when suddenly the Polish guards, men whose wives, daughters, sons were killed in Auschwitz, they treated him well. And he couldn't understand. And that was the moment of his conversion, because they treated him well. Mercy, that's the love that we know we do not deserve. He knew he doesn't deserve their forgiveness, their goodness, their gentleness, their help. And he received all that. So then he asked for a priest. He wanted to confess his sins before he dies. Please understand, it happens straight after the Second World War. Wounds are very fresh. So the guards said, okay, we will find you a priest. But it wasn't easy to find a priest who would like to listen to the confession of Rudolf Hess. So they couldn't find one. And then Rudolf Hess remembered the name of the Jesuit priest whom he let go a few years before. And so he gave them the name saying, please try to find this man. Maybe he will come. And so they found him in the shrine of divine mercy in Krakow where we are stationed. He was our chaplain at that time. And so he went. He said, okay, I will go. And he listened to his confession. It lasted and lasted and lasted. And then he gave him absolution. Your sins are forgiven. Rudolf Hess, you animal, your sins are forgiven. Go in peace. The next day, Father Lon came to, he, to the prison again, but not alone. He's never alone, of course, but this time he came like in real, real presence of God. He brought Jesus, he brought Holy Communion to Rudolf Hess. And the guard who was present uh, in the very room with Rudolf Hess and the priest said it was one of the most beautiful moments in his life, seeing the, this animal yes, kneeling uh, with tears in his eyes, looking like a little boy, and receiving Holy Commun 
communion, receiving Jesus to his heart. Unimaginable mercy. Rudolf Hess, before he died, um, he wrote a letter, an open letter. He wanted to be published after his death uh, in Polish newspapers. And in that letter he said, I know what I did. I know how great is my sin and my guilt. But God forgave me. And now I ask you, the Polish nation, the Polish people, to forgive me as well. I hope you can do it. Faustina writes in her diary that we should never, ever judge anyone, ever. And we cannot say anything about salvation or condemnation of anyone. Look, in our church, there are so many saints. Church declared uh, their yes, holiness of so many people. But never, ever have I heard that someone is declared or being called condemned yes, that we do not know we do not know and surely we cannot do it by ourselves there are so there is such a mystery between you and god and every human being his soul and god mystery we cannot say anything we do not know So when you look at the divine mercy image, in the gaze of the one whom you killed is pure forgiveness and total acceptation, total understanding. Then when you look at his right hand, again, look, this is a pierced hand. When you look closely, there, you will see there is a wound on this hand. And this wounded hand is in the gesture of blessing. How do we react? How do we answer when someone hurts us? With blessing? It would be good, but we must be honest to ourselves. Usually, it's not like that. Jesus teaches us through the diary of Saint Faustina Always, when someone hurts you, think quickly, what good can you do to that person? That's Christianity. Nothing less. Then there is the left hand touching his pierced heart, and there are the rays. Um, the rays which are very important on the image. And actually, I assume you all know that they symbolize blood and water. Uh, and blood stands for the Eucharist. Water stands for all the sacraments which bring us purification. So first of all, baptism and then, of course, confession. Jesus says that happy are those who shelter in the shadow, shadow of this race. There are so many people who are miserable, maybe outside smiled, yes, uh, but deeply inside miserable, totally sad, bitter, disappointed. Jesus says, happy are those who shelter in the shadow of this race. So whenever you find someone who's miserable, who's, uh, who feels uh, unhappy, sad, um, do not take him to movies or to let's go shopping, yes? Or, um, but, okay, sometimes that's also good, but... That's not really the solution of the problem. 
the solution of the problem is in the shadow of this race. Confession, Eucharist. That's the best uh, medica med medicine to all the pains, moanings, uh, wounds, sadness. Confession and Eucharist. So many people, though they are in the church, they stopped believing in the power of sacraments and Jesus is truly present in the sacraments. Half of the diary of Sister Faustina is really about the sacraments, what's happening during Eucharist and what's happening during confess confession. What's Jesus doing in these sacraments? We see the priests who do all these things in, during the Eucharist, during confession. Um, we see the priests because we would die on heart attacks seeing Jesus, you know, being present here and sitting at the confessional box. We wouldn't survive any confession, you know, seeing the holy, holy, holy one listening to us. That's too much for our, you know, human hearts. Faustina was prepared after many purifications. She was ready. Probably we are not yet ready. So he covers, you know, covers, no, hide, hides behind the, the priest, but he's there. And th this is him who's really forgiving our sins and then giving you a new start, a new beginning. Uh, it would be good if we would have the courage to, to share this with other people, not only use it for ourselves, okay? I know it, that's good, I will use it, it will be for me. I will be purified and I will be alive. Yes, confession and Eucharist. It would be good to have the courage to say it aloud, even to people who do not think the same as we do, who do not believe. But it takes courage to do it because we are all afraid that we will be laugh at, laugh at, that people will laugh at us, we will be rejected, we won't have friends, we won't have likes on Facebook and, and that's a disaster. So um, the core of the Divine Mercy message is simply I am love and mercy itself, says Jesus. Come to me. I want to heal your wounds. I do not want to punish you for your sins, but I want to heal your wounded heart. Let me do it. And trust that I know the best way, the best time, the best situation, how to do it and when to do it. Leave this to me. It's so hard for us to let God really be the God of our lives. Especially now, in the 21st century, when we feel we are really so intelligent and um, we can do so, we can invent so many things which help us to live. You know, we fly to space, we, we have all these computers, iPads, iPhones, everything, whatever we want, it comes true with just we need a few years to invent something new, even more amazing. And suddenly Jesus comes and says, let me be your God. Let me guide you the way I want. And this is trust. Usually uh, we think about trust like, okay, God is good, so that means he will make everything good in my life. Yes, I will tell him 
The, the, the very simple example, okay, I'm going on exam, uh, I will pray, and he will make, make it happen that I will get an A, yes. Because I trust him so deeply. Yes. And we treat God as magician, like magician, yes. Or like the, the Aladdin, you know, the, the one from the bottle. This is my wish, and you are to fulfill my wish. Are you not the merciful God, the good God? You know, I do all you ask me to do. I pray, I go to the church. So now you fulfill your obligations towards me, okay? Who is God in this situation? Jesus, I trust in you. Uh, is really about a childlike attitude towards him. It's so hard to be children when we are grown-ups. Be a child towards me. Let me be your God. Let me be your guide. Let me be your father. Let me take you wherever I want, trusting that this is the best of all the possible ways. And you are not to be afraid of it. That will be it because my time is up. <laughs> so I won't even start another subject. But uh, please feel encouraged to search by yourself. The diary of St. Faustina is like a mine, mine of gold, full of gold. And you go deeper and deeper and you discover new and new treasures in it. Um, so I think this year the Jubilee of Mercy is the best time to really, you know, like read the diary, uh, search uh, for new inspirations in the diary. And then as you already get this perspective of mercy that Faustina had, uh, you will be able to look at every event of your personal life and of the events that happen around you, in the country, in your neighborhood, in your city, through the perspective of mercy. And it makes a life totally different. No fear, just trust.